everyone. I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this is Cowboy Logic Radio. And welcome to Cowboy Logic Radio, everyone. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen. And I'm Don Newen, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm pissed off. Back to you, Donna. Darn. He's not in a very good mood tonight, but you know what? Neither am I. We're seriously PO'd. I cannot believe... You know, just when you think it can't get any worse, it did. Just when you think Robert Mueller couldn't do anything worse, he did. Just when you think our rights can't be trampled on anymore, they are. And there's nobody who can talk about that better than one Tom Del Beccaro. So we're going to bring him in right now because we're going to have him on actually for the next two seconds. We had planned to have you on, Tom, I should tell everybody. You know, as we usually do, to talk about things like California secession, since you are the former chairman of the California Republican Party, you are the publisher of politicalvanguard.com, and also you've written numerous books, one of which I always say is my favorite, The Divided Era, because essentially you talk about how at the beginning of a uh, government, there's a competition for ideas, and then at the end, there's a competition for spoils, and I firmly believe that's what's happening right now. So Tom Del Beccaro, uh, oh, I should give your website, how could I not? Politicalvanguard.com. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio, Senator because if California did have half you? a brain in there, but you would be the senator and they wouldn't have Kamala Harris. How you doing, Tom? <laughs> I'm doing great. All right, let's cut. Great to hear your voice. I'm as angry as you are. Yeah, this let's cut right to the chase. Let's cut right to the chase. Mueller ends up raiding Cohen's office, his home, and his hotel room. Tell me from a legal perspective, Tom Telbacaro, what's going on? Start with go second to the legal. Let's go first with the political. Cheryl Mills lied to the FBI, got immunity. Nobody's office was raided. In fact, she entered into a deal with the FBI that she would give up her laptop, but they had to destroy it afterward. Contrast that. And and by the way, those were actual crimes. She lied to the FBI. Hillary did destroy things. Contrast that with the treatment for Trump's lawyer over what? An SEC violation? Who cares? A campaign finance violation? They happen all the time. Nobody gets raided. But he wasn't even a member of of Trump's campaign. He's his personal lawyer. This is is something else. It's it's unbelievable. So... (laughs) This is who Mueller is. He is Captain Ahab. He was this way in Boston when the, when the evidence showed that four people in jail shouldn't have been in jail. They were innocent. But he kept them there to keep up the Whitey Bulger fraud. Two of those people died in jail. And the government had to pay tens of millions because this complete, incompetent, unethical jerk known as Robert Mueller wouldn't look at the facts and do the right thing. He completely blew the anthrax thing. Yeah. He's not competent, nor by any stretch, and I tweeted this out tonight to, to uh, Gowdy. I'm calling Trey Gowdy out. Stop telling America that this guy is somehow above board. He, he has done nothing in his lifetime to warrant the praise that has been given to him. And now we have this. On a day when the country has to deal with Syria, he pulls this stunt. There was no reason to do this. If they suspect that this guy was doing it, and by the way, bank fraud is investigated every day of the week. That's what they're claiming. It's investigated every day of the week. 
without raids. Campaign finance violations occur every day of the week. They're the easiest things on earth to prove, by the way. All they have to do is get the check and the agreement. But this is who Mueller is. This is the studs he polls. And by the way, we all remind me when Perkins Cooey, the Hillary campaign law firm, who was given $12 million. Will you remind me when they raided Perkins Cooey? I uh, don't think they did, Tom. Yeah, but you know what, Tom? Yeah, exactly. This, this reminds me a lot uh, on the travesty of justice that was slammed against Dinesh D'Souza. You mentioned a minute ago that FCC yeah, violations exactly. do not warrant this kind of behavior. FCC violations do not warrant putting an individual in prison for six months either. Dinesh D'Souza was railroaded. This is becoming the practice of the left. This is becoming no, it's, it's, the law of the left. And it's, uh, I believe it's unconstitutional. So much of what Mueller's doing is, look, he's been overturned. We've talked about this. His deputies have been overturned. He's got a travesty for a record. I, but this, this is the incest that is Washington and why our country's in so much trouble. Maybe we should call up Rod Rosenstein's wife and ask her, since she represented the Clinton Foundation and Bill Clinton, why the Clintons were their lawyers weren't raided, or why they haven't been raided? We know the answer because the fix was in. And on the other hand, we have this out of control prospect. And you know, if if you're out there listening, and you hate Trump, or you hate anything else, I don't really care. If you can't figure it out that this guy going in and taking things from a lawyer's office, including attorney-client privilege documents, and you don't find that to be a threat, if they can do it to someone, that the president's attorney, imagine what they could do to you. That's what I was saying. In fact, uh, Mark Levin had Andrew McCarthy on today, who prosecuted Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the 9-11 mastermind, okay? You know what Andrew McCarthy told him? He said they had three attorneys on their team. Three. This is for the mastermind of 9-11. Robert Mueller has 17. Donald Trump now has one. And I believe that's Jay Sekulow because, you, you know, this guy Cohen now has to lawyer up himself. I mean, this is insane. And he's been Donald Trump's personal attorney for decades. The scary thing, and is obviously Hillary Clinton, you know, worked this way and was able to get around this. Every single time she had something going on, she injected lawyers at every turn. So everything was attorney-client privilege over and over and over again. So this is how she was able to get away with it. Not to mention, like you say, the fix was in. Comey wrote her letter exonerating her weeks before she even testified. She didn't even testify, I don't believe, under oath. Sorry, it's so out of control, I can't even describe the breadth and magnitude of the Fourth Amendment violations that have been going on. You can make the argument that 100% of what Mueller's doing will be overturned because they're because of Fourth Amendment violation that started with the FISA application. We, we have a, a, a simple process in our, in our country. It says that if, if you get information through a corrupted process, everything thereafter, you can't use that information. Well, that goes pretty far. That goes all the way. Every single thing FISA on. Comey exists because of the the fraudulent FISA application. And now he goes in there (laughs) and he grabs everything the attorney had. He didn't grab his bank records. He grabbed his communications with Trump. 
How does you that? How is that allowed, though? Because doesn't somebody? Because now he's using the Southern District of New York to get this done. Doesn't somebody in the FBI and the Southern District of New York have to sign off on this? And and doesn't they have to have irrefutable proof that this needs to be done at such a high level? Yes, but. We know that, Comey, all of these guys have been overturned many times before. You mean Mueller? Well, yes, Mueller's, I'm sorry. Mueller's been overturned and done horribly wrong things before. And Andrew and Weitzman, the same thing with his second in command, Andrew Weitzman. But see, the whole point is the damage is done. And you're ruining the president of the United States here. You're leaving the yeah, United no, no. He doesn't States. Care. He doesn't care. Yeah, but you know this what? We're wait a minute. Minute. Hold on a second. That is the objective. They don't care how they do it. They just want to ruin him. Van Jones talked about it the night of the election. Eric Holder has talked about it since he moved to California. Yeah. The only no person that hasn't been talking about this is Loretta Lynch, and she probably has in the shadows. Their objective is to take him down. They don't care what it does to the country. They don't care how ethical or unethical it is. They don't care if they're breaking laws. They don't care if they're breaking the Constitution. All they care about is taking him down. And they will do it at absolutely all costs. And think about the implications here. If you're even thinking about running for president, you think you're going to put yourself through this again if you're not a politician? Okay, so wait a minute. You need to back that up because I've been talking about this for a long time. You want to run for president? (laughs) My point is, this is their manner of chilling. During the Obama administration, how did they chill participation? They they uh, had the IRS hassle conservatives. Mm-hmm. Now that we have a Republican president, the way they chill future people from getting involved is they do, is that they they do all these investigations, and good people don't want to get investigated, so this stops them from doing this. Exactly, because who doesn't have skeletons in their closet, especially if you're going to get an anal exam like this? If they want to go after you, they'll find something. I mean, you know, maybe you didn't pay $2 extra in your taxes. This is insanity. The other thing they were talking about today on Levin's show with uh, Andrew McCarthy is that this is a 30-year jail sentence. So now they've got Cohen up there thinking he could go to jail for 30 years. And, of course, Trump could probably pardon him. But yeah, exactly. Their goal is simple. They want to impeach Donald Trump. End of story. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. That's it. It's real simple. Now, Tom Del Bacaro, let me ask you this. Attorney client privileges. That is something that in in our constitution and in the law is considered to be a sacred part of uh confidentiality. That it went out be. the window today, correct? Not entirely. So uh, attorneys can't shield themselves from committing crimes by attorney-client privilege. So if they're involved in the crime, if they're just giving advice, then they are shielded. So, for instance, if a mob lawyer was the bag man or a mob lawyer drove the car, the mob lawyer couldn't say, well... I'm his attorney, therefore you're not allowed to investigate what I said to him while I was carrying the money. So in order to establish this particular thing, they're going to have to show that Cohen, in fact, was committing crimes related to Trump. Or this could just be about Cohen doing something wrong and Trump having nothing to do with that either. That's very possible, too. What about an attorney delivering but, I mean, Uranium the, the One? Thing that bothers, what yeah, about an attorney so delivering is, Uranium no, One? An FBI director. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is, let me what's ask you this. Re- is really, Mueller an attorney? What, yeah. What's really okay. troubling about all of this is that they are just investigating people. That's their goal. Yeah. We are just going to start investigating and investigating people. Your name's Donald Trump. We're going to investigate anyone associated with you. We're just going to start looking into things. Even Manafort, though, 
it, it's scary. But even Manafort at this point, uh, you know, they raided his house in the wee hours of the morning the same way. And I believe he's got a case against them at this point. This is total well, he's overst- got a, for- a Fourth Amendment defense. And the manner in which he, he has obtained things, he being Mueller, and not kept them separated out, all of this could get thrown out. I hope Manafort has the wherewithal to carry it all the way through and get this stuff overturned, but it's an expensive process. But what does Donald Trump do now? Technically, he only has one lawyer. And they're saying he should go to court first thing tomorrow morning and say this has to stop until I can get um, the proof that this was a raid that was necessary. Meanwhile, he's, you know, we might start a war with Syria. And of course, you're going to hear the left say, oh, wag the dog, because supposedly that's what Bill Clinton did with Monica Lewinsky. But he's been, you know, this is something that happened over the weekend. He was talking about doing. And this, again, leaves the president of the United States and the American people at high, high risk. And I, for one, think there's a lot of people on the left that aren't going to put up with this either. In fact, Trump even said he saw a reporter. This was uh, during this uh, press conference he had uh, this evening that he saw a reporter talking and and that was not a friend of his and actually said to him, you know, this is kind of overstepping bounds. And I want to play a piece of that um, that uh, interview, in fact, if we can. What happened is right after this happened, the market tanked like 500 points. It had been up, you know, well, about 400 points. It had been up 400 points. It tanked right back down almost to zero. It was up slightly, maybe 50, 60 points. And that after being up 400, that's nothing. Then, of course, it popped right back up during the overnight hours because of all of Trump saying he's fighting back. But the whole situation is this causes people to lose money as well. But listen to uh, what Trump did say late afternoon. It literally literally endangers the world. Yes, it really does. But um, I just want to preface this by saying Trump initially alluded to the fact that he's still not happy with Sessions and that, you know, this continues on and there was no collusion. And as he then he talked about possibly retaliating against Bashar al-Assad in Syria because he used chemical weapons again on his own people, men, women and children all being killed off. But as this uh, press conference was breaking up, a reporter shouted to him. Let's listen to this. Why don't you just fire Mueller? Why don't I just fire Mueller? Well, I think it's a disgrace what's going on. We'll see what happens. But I think it's really a sad situation when you look at what happened. And many people have said you should fire him. Uh, Again, they found nothing. And in finding nothing, uh, that's a big statement. If you know the person who's in charge of the investigation, uh, you know all about that. Uh, Deputy Rosenstein, Rod Rosenstein, he wrote the letter very critical of Comey. One of the things they said, I fired Comey. Well, I turned out to do the right thing because you look at all of the things that he's done and the lies and you look at what's gone on at the FBI with the insurance policy and all of the things that happened. Turned out I did the right thing. Uh, But he signed, as you know, he also signed the FISA warrant. So Rod Rosenstein, who's in charge of this, signed a FISA warrant and he also He also signed a letter that was essentially saying to fire James Comey. And he was right about that. He was absolutely right. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I think it's uh, disgraceful, and so does a lot of other people. This is a pure and simple witch hunt. All right, Tom Del Beccaro, let me ask you a question. Just from your knowledge of issuing warrants and the legal system that's involved in in what transpired on monday how long does it take to prepare to get the warrant that they got in order to raid cohen's home his office and his temporary hotel room how long would that normally take um actually it doesn't take very long if there's ex- exigent circumstances but uh they've probably been working on this a month 
See, I think that this is a ruse because the IG report is supposed to come out in a couple of weeks, and I think this is going to be a, a way for them to counteract that. Uh, I, I think they did do it now in anticipation of that coming out and sort of to preempt it. I think that report's going to be incredibly ugly. Yeah, they say there could be some indictments handed down. But, you know, to me, the people that need to be indicted are the people that are investigating Trump. I mean, if Jeff Sessions recuses yeah, there himself... Were crimes, <laughs> there were crimes committed in connection with the obtaining of these initial warrants and everything like that. No question about it. And, and that's why this stuff's going to be thrown out, in my view. You know, you can't lie on a FISA warrant to get it. The law says it has to be verified. They knew it wasn't. Therefore, everything obtained subsequent to that gets thrown out. And there could be uh, serious, I mean, if they lied, they could face jail time. And so there's a lot of shoes to drop here. And I, I yes, it's, uh, it's very possible that, that um, some of this stuff gets thrown out, that, that people go to jail. I mean, I don't know where this is going to end. This is awful. Yeah, but you know what? The other thing is, what's happened before with what Mueller and this other really vile individual, Andrew Weitzman, has done, he's the guy who caused 85,000 people... destroyed lives and companies. 85,000 people to lose their jobs and was overturned in the Supreme Court 9-0. to zero. But you know what? They, and they withheld evidence. And for, for a 9-0... to zero, overturning in the Supreme Court, you got to be pretty egregious. The problem is, if past performance is indica- indicative of future results, the damage will already be done. And that, I, I obviously believe, is what they're trying to do. In fact, Judge Napolitano was saying on Fox that Judge Scalia talked about how dangerous a special counsel is. All I can say on that one is bingo. The special counsel is terrible. And remember, they were very critical of, um, what's his face, from Breitbart when he left Trump's, uh, um, when he left the White House. Bannon. Bannon, when he was fired because, or he left, whatever happened. But Bannon said that that is the big problem, is the special counsel. And, and nobody wanted to believe him. All right, Tom Del Bacaro, we're going to go to break here. I'd like to give you a couple of minutes during the break to think about the following question that I'm going to hit you with when we come back. That question is, if you were flown to the White House tomorrow morning to have a one-on-one meeting with President Trump, how, as a lawyer, would you advise him to move forward and what steps would you advise him to take? Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to break when we get back. We'll have Tom Del Bacaro with us. In the meantime, we're going to feature an angry professor of a university. We're doing a two-minute spot with her. We're going to try to do it every week for you, but you'll have that on the break. Hi, thank you for listening. My name is Ron Phillips, and I'm the owner and operations manager of Talk America Radio. It is with great pride that I offer you this 24-7 stream of some of the finest talk radio programming in the country, but I need your support. We are a listener-supported network. That means we need your help to continue to offer the quality programming you're hearing right now. If you're able, please visit talkamericaradio.us and click the Support Us button. Your donation will go a long way in helping us continue to share the American voice. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Chronicles of Lower Education with your host, the Fed Up Professor. Today's glimpse into how the Academy is committing suicide is a true story of a former student of mine. I'll call her Twyla. 
an English major who took both my senior seminars plus three other classes. Oh yeah, and she was expecting a baby in nine weeks, so she'd be missing half the semester, but she'd work from home. It was all going to be fine. She informed me that she was going to need at least a C in my classes, thank you very much, because she absolutely had to graduate this semester. And of course, she'll need me to send her all of my lecture notes during her prolonged absence. Yeah, okay. Well, 16 grueling weeks later, Twyla submits her research papers, and I can tell immediately that she's plagiarized like crazy in both of them. Google confirmed my suspicions in about two seconds, so I post big fat Fs as her final grades and forward everything to my boss, who mentions in passing that, yeah, another colleague had also caught Twyla plagiarizing. Then came her angry emails. She told me she needed Cs. She couldn't come to any of our end of semester writing workshops and that's totally unfair. I never taught her how to avoid palagrism. What? Oh, that's how she spells plagiarism. Well, she appeals her grades to the department chair. Denied. The dean? Denied. The vice president of academic affairs? Denied. Great. Justice was served. Not. Because the next semester, the university decides to give Twyla another chance. So, back she came to school and graduated with a degree in my program. And the final blow, a colleague who knew everything about this palagrist actually wrote Twyla a letter of recommendation because she wanted to be in solidarity with the humane decision to give this poor girl another chance. And the value of a university degree shrinks even further, and that's why I am the Fed Up Professor. See you next week. This is Don Newen, co-host of the Drive Time Sit Rep. Join me as I call in to my intel analyst, Denise Simon, for my daily situation report, or Sit Rep, the Drive Time Sit Rep. Check TalkAmericaRadio.us for more information and show times. You're listening to your local news source, WLBB, News Talk 1330 and And we're back. And we're back. Yes. <laughs> we're uh, affectionately mimicking. mimicking our dear friend, Brendy Richards, from South Africa. And Ladies and gentlemen, back. welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm an angry Don Newen. He's a P.O.'d Don Newen. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We've got our dear friend, the stellar, the excellent, the riveting... Tom Del Bacaro on here with us, ladies and gentlemen. And before we went to break, I gave Tom about three minutes to think of his answer that he's going to lay on us now. And that is, if Donald Trump flew you to the White House tomorrow morning, Tom Del Bacaro, to advise him on how to deal with this latest mess, what would you say to him? Two things. I would say that they should go to court immediately uh, to for a motion to quash what was done, uh, and they that meaning the rating of Cohen and all of his documents, I'm sure that Cohen's going to do the same thing. They should join it, and they should say that uh, an affidavit attorney-client privilege information was taken and given the allegations, it didn't meet the proper standards, and attempt to have a in-camera court review, meaning that a judge viewing the documentation and not the FBI. That's number one. Number two, I would file a similar. I would file a motion in uh, district court, uh, quashing any attempt by Robert Mueller to communicate with or in, uh, interview the president. There is no evidence of collusion, which is not a crime with Russia. There's no evidence of illegal activity related to the president and Russia. That was his original charge. 
Trump is not a material witness, and therefore he, he cannot be charged. And there's case law about you can't question a public official on simply carrying out their legal obligations or their uh, or their authority. That's why the ex-Texas governor, Rick Perry, the case was thrown out against him. The same principles hold when it relates to Trump. And therefore, that should be uh, he, he should he should block any attempt for Mueller to do that unless he can demonstrate evidence of he being Mueller can demonstrate evidence of a crime. Well, the crime that they're saying now is an illegal campaign contribution. And everybody's saying it's a valid contract uh, between two consenting adults, basically for yeah, so Stormy is, Daniels this, to this go away. A, <laughs> yeah, this is why it's a separate issue of what's going on. It, it, this may simply be related to something else that he did. It's hard to tell, but but we'll tell soon enough. But there's yeah, no but way then Trump everything, talk to Mueller. everything that Cohn has done with Trump is out in the open now. How can that be legal? I mean, they're saying that Cohn had uh, um, some dealing on Trump's behalf for a hotel in Russia that never even materialized. You know, or that Trump was paid a hundred. Who cares? It's not a crime. It wasn't a crime, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, but he can use it. He can use any little thing. Put it this way: if you got seventeen lawyers, and now you've got Jay Sekulow versing seven seventeen lawyers here, and Cohn has to get his own lawyer, this is in absolute insanity. This is government gone wild. It really is. It's government gone wild. To me. The deep swamp is in a death roll right now because they know if if Mueller isn't successful, the House of Cards is coming down on these guys. There may anyway with the uh, inspector general's report. There may be no way to stop this. This could be the ugliest year in American politics. I think it already is. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got our dear friend Tom Del Bacaro with us tonight. <laughs> Tom, let's go to that uh, inspector general report that's uh, due out any time look into that crystal ball you got and tell me what you think and and we get it this is prognostication we're guessing but what do you think's gonna come out of this hard-hitting critique of the fisa process saying that it was not done properly hard-hitting critique of the hillary investigation saying it was not done properly and potentially uh, evidence that Andrew McCabe and others lied in addition to breaking FBI rules. And if, they, if, and if he's willing to say they lied, and of course, we already know that they did, because that's why he was fired internally, then he could make criminal referrals. So those are the levels, those are the categories. But what, what matters is whether it, it raises to the next level which is a criminal referral based on what they did i don't see how it can't be how can you give 145 million dollars to russia with uranium one and 20 percent of our uranium to the russians how can you even send i'm sorry uh, uh, 150 billion dollars to iran on skids in cash in the middle of the night i mean there's so the way, much uh, mm-hmm. By the way, I'm glad you brought brought that up. This is a little off topic. But everybody in the uranium deal, when that first came out, they concentrated on the wrong thing. And quite honestly, I think I concentrated on the right thing. Because I said the most dangerous thing about that deal was providing cash to Iran so that they can continue to empower themselves on the ground and the dominant in the Middle East. And they have taken that money and they have used it to, uh, and this is a Washington Times article of mine, to bolster their forces and even get money into Syria. That was the, the immediate danger and goal, and that has gone on. Yep. 
And look what's happening right now. We have a president trying to deal with Syria while Mueller's doing this garbage. Don had another question. Well, I just want to correct something. Tom, you said uranium one, and then you referred to the Iran deal. I'm sure you were talking about the Iran deal where we gave them boatloads the of yeah. money. Which, yeah, which yeah, yeah. Here's the bottom line. That did two things. It funded Hamas, it funded terrorism all over the world, and it bolstered their nuclear program. Yeah, South. We all know that. Everybody. But that's the long-term thing, and they were they were willing to trade the long-term goal for immediate money because they want to be the most powerful in the Middle East, and they thought they had to have a nuclear weapon to do that. Instead, they did it with conventional gains on the ground, and they needed the money to solidify those conventional gains and. That's where we are with respect to uh, <laughs> Syria today. They're able to exert influence in part because they got the money. Well, I, I think it points to Valerie Jarrett, Iranian-born and very tight with Barack Obama, and she got a lot of money oh, from her Oh, John Kerry's daughter is married to who? Yep. An Iranian. Yep. And, and the an thing Ar- is... An, Irani- an Iranian diplomat's daughter or son. Yep. yep. Um, it's insane. Yeah, it's in, it's so incestuous. Um, I'm not sure if you heard in all the stuff that went on earlier in this week here with all these appointees, the Department of Justice, maybe Jeff Session is doing something, I don't know, appointed another U.S. attorney. His name is John Lausch from Chicago as a chief prosecutor. He's apparently a chief prosecutor from Chicago, which right off the bat to me should disqualify him. Anyhow, to look into why the FBI is dragging its feet on giving documents to Congress to oversee the FISA probe documents, essentially. And, and uh, again, if this is such a, if the FBI is on the up and up in all this, why is the documents not getting from the or the DOJ, I should say, getting to Congress. I mean, the DOJ, where is Jeff Sessions on this? He hasn't recused himself from this. It's not on the up and up. So there's no reason for you to to give that qualification anymore. It hasn't been on the up and up at all. Who's Somebody's and, got something on Jeff Sessions. I'm sorry. No, I don't think so. I, I think it's still plausible, but there's a mix of... He's not the best on earth at doing this. And the fact that some of this information is finally getting to the right people. And there is going to be, uh, there is going to be indictments. Uh, there needs to be a second case. All right, Tom Del Bacaro, let me ask you this. Should President Trump fire Mueller? Yes or no? Um, maybe. If you were advising him, what would you tell him? To wipe out everyone at the top and start over. You can't just fire one. You can't fire what Rosenstein. You're gonna let him stick. You're gonna let some of these. You're gonna you're gonna have Peter Strzok there. You're gonna have Lisa Page. Lisa Page yeah. If you were gonna fire it, you would have to say, "Look, we've seen what this is about now. So I'm not gonna fire one person. We are gonna fire the whole upper echelon, and we're gonna start new. And if the new people." think this is the way to go, then I'll be damned. But in the meantime, we are not using this process for witch hunts. Only if he was willing to go far enough. You know, the thing is, Donna and I have always said, and I think you agree with us on this, anybody that is committing crimes, anyone that is committing corrupt activities needs to be held fully accountable and punished to the full extent of the law. Anybody, whether they've got an R behind their name, a D, an I, a communist, whatever it is, they need to be punished and they need to be held accountable. But the thing uh, is, look, as I, as I, as huh? I said, if, if, if we don't, we will have destroyed our country if we let them get away with this. I agree. But the thing is, if, and I think that Trump has been holding off on doing anything with regard to firing anybody. So that, A, he can be exonerated by this whatever is going on with Mueller. He's hoping that he will be exonerated from that. I know, I know. With regard to collusion, yes. But also, I think he's waiting on that IG report. But I got to tell you, man, 
when that report comes out, if it's as damaging as you think it may be, and we hope that it will be, then I think swift action needs to be taken because this is getting to a point where it's affecting the national security of our country. Period. End of story. Yeah, well, be careful with those words because that's what the Democrats are going to say about Trump. They're when already saying it. They've report. been saying that. They're already saying it. The IG report was supposed to be out months ago. And see, I, I don't trust uh, this guy either. He's uh, maybe, in the bomb maybe, maybe he's finding more stuff than he can imagine. Maybe. All right. There's a, so, lot, of, there's a lot, of, lot of pressure on that guy. So, again, with this a new attorney now, John Lausch from Chicago, even Session needs an outside independent supervisor to push why the DOJ has is dragging its feet, not giving the documents to Congress. I mean, this is so ridiculous. I want your opinion now, Tom Del Beccaro. And again, folks, you can find him at politicalvanguard.com. Tom Del Beccaro, what's your take now on this other prosecutor appointed from Utah by Jeff Sessions, this guy Huber? Well, thank God that they... Uh they picked a guy who wasn't from Washington, D.C., because now you can see how this works. You have uh, Rod Rosenstein's wife represented the Clintons and Obama. So he can't be trusted for anything. Mueller, Uranium One, the friends with Comey. He can't be trusted for anything. So I'm very glad that Jeff Sessions picked a guy who isn't a lifelong Washington, dc -er, and is from a state far away. Maybe he won't be corrupted. But don't the special, I mean, the um, grand juries have to be impaneled here in D.C.? Because now we're fighting on three different fronts now with what happened on Monday with what Mueller did raiding Cohen's office. That brings the New York, Southern District of New York, that's Manhattan in, we already know Mueller went to D.C. as well as Virginia with all his garbage. Okay, so your, your boy Comey hasn't just done it in D.C. He's also done it in Virginia. Don't worry about where the grand... You don't actually need a grand jury. I know you're all obsessed about a grand jury. You don't actually need a grand jury. If I shoot someone on TV, they don't need a grand jury to view the tapes. So just look at it and say you're arrested. There you go. The vast majority of crimes that are prosecuted there's been no grand jury involved yeah i guess but to so me don't, so don't worry about that all right but the bottom line though and it it's, keeps bothering me here that we have a two-tier justice system i mean of course well okay but we always the world has always had that yeah i know the we saw chapaquiddick this past weekend <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question is we're a country that used to be able to rise above it. And we can now because we have a corrupt Washington. All, remember this. All large governments in history, all of them, are corrupt. That is in their nature. History is an argument between and the reality of, of a clash between private greed and public graft. And we are in the stage of public graft. So don't be shocked by this, but we got to fight it. Well, this to me is bread and circuses. And this also, again, goes back to your book, Tom Del Beccaro, The Divided Era, because this is exactly what it talks about. Let me reintroduce you here. We're talking with Tom Del Beccaro. Again, he's a good friend of ours, former chairman of the California Republican Party, obviously a lawyer, and uh, would be very happy to go to Trump Tower and advise Donald Trump because right now Trump needs some lawyers. Anyhow, um, he did run against Kamala Harris in California. And again, if California was able to put one Republican and one Democrat on the ticket, chances are you could have won. But that's not how things work. I do want to get to California real quick, though, Tom. Um, as far as the gubernatorial election in California. I just want to step away from all this Mueller crap because I'm going nuts with it. With what's going on in California, the gubernatorial candidate actually is uh, gaining some steam and might even be moving into second place because I think people are fed up with what's going on in California talking about secession now. I think, uh, thankfully, Cal the Democrats... Uh, ability 
to hide what's going on, what's going wrong and what's going on in California has been diminished. This started in January with the bicyclists who, who showed the miles of homelessness and then that eventually wound up uh, being a national story. The sanctuary city thing, the murder of Kate Steinle and that atrocious ruling and on and on. People are beginning to see what the bad about what's happening in California. Very hard to predict turnout. I'm hopeful someone will finish in the top two, but there's two popular Republicans and four popular Democrats. So I'm not sure who's going to finish in the top two. I will predict that Gavin Newsom will be the highest Mm -hmm. vote getter in June. Unfortunately. You want me to tell you what the rest of the country thinks about the citizens of California, Tom? Especially especially those that... No, no, the citizens of California. I'm a citizen of California. (laughs) I know. I'm going to tell you what the rest of us think. Especially those of you that are conservatives. We wonder why in the hell you're there. That's what we wonder. Well, uh, the answer is is because I, I... I have a law firm here, and this is where I make money. It's hard for me to go somewhere else. That's uh, that's a complete untruth. You could hang that shingle any place, and you could no, end up making. No, you can't. I'd have to go study you, the bar again and go. No, and go but find you could this. you could come to a state like Georgia or go to a state like Texas, and you could make more money and keep more of your hard earned money that you make. Yeah, but see, I don't think that's the. Pro- I I disagree with you, honey, and I'll tell you why, Tom. We want everybody to stay in California because what's happening? Yeah, really. Look at Colorado. No, 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 no. Look at New Mexico. What's the name of this show? Cowboy Logic. There you go. So here's Cowboy Logic. Okay. All of the conservatives need to get out of California and leave the cesspool of a state to all the liberal pukes that made it that way. But that's the the problem is a lot of liberal pukes have a lot of money. And, and we don't the take ones, them. We but, don't want them. We don't want them in our state. But that's they what happened stay in there. Colorado. Colorado got a Colorado lot of... Colorado smokes dope. Well, what do you think's happening to <laughs> Southern Florida? Southern Florida... Is, is being overrun by Puerto Ricans coming out of Puerto Rico. And New Yorkers. They say the farther south you go in Florida, the Cuban. farther north you get. Look, <laughs> I don't want the liberal pukes from California moving into the state that I live in. I think... And, and, and that's fine for me to feel that way. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I really think Trump's tax law is going to hurt red states. Just because of what Don is talking about, people are voting with their feet. And, and they're Tom getting Del the Bacaro, heck out. We're in trouble here in Georgia. While I'm on this roll, Tom Del Bacaro, if you want to leave the state of California and come to the state of Georgia, we have plenty of room we will while you put build you a house. Up in our home free of charge. We will feed you, we will clothe you, and we will help you find a new practice and I so would, that you can practice law in the great state of georgia I and start I, taking I home more of your own there. hard-earned money and i would venture to say that uh you know the the 250 acres next to us could be bought for less than your house in california <laughs> i thought you were gonna i thought i was running for senator there i'm hurt you can well, do you that can come too. do that too i don't care just get out of this cesspool of a state you live in i get it they got big trees and they're cool looking but when's the last time you went to the beach and hung out in, in the waters there in San Francisco Bay? It's cold. I up never there. do. When I you do were an San extra Diego. on uh, Escape from Alcatraz? <laughs> I, did, I, do, I do that in San Diego, John. He does. That's warmer. Well, well there really- you go. Well, you got to travel 550 miles to get down to San Diego so you can hang out on the beach. Hey, that, that group sure. that, you know, that saying, get out of that state. Get out of that state you're in is from Georgia. (laughs) I did not know that. Ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) we are so upset about what is going on here. I need some comic relief. That we have to have some comic relief. We have a couple minutes left. Let's talk, talk about comic relief. Let's talk about Mark Zuckerberg. He met with lawmakers on Monday before testifying And, gee, lo and behold, I would venture to say that he met mostly with Democrat lawmakers. They had this big thing saying Facebook has 
um, given just as much money to Democrats as it had Republicans. But then you got to read the very bottom paragraph that says, well, not really. In general, over a number of years, it's like 30 to 70 percent. That's pretty much it that most of Facebook and Facebook employees have given to Democrats. But it made Zuckerberg, well, who's 33 years by old. That, are you? <laughs> yeah, really. Well, here's the shocking news. What you guys don't know is that I think Zuckerberg met with Donna Brazil and she got and he got all the answers that he needs to talk about when he goes against his little hearing that I he's got to do. Surprised, but you know what? He actually put on a uh, he's going to put on a suit. They said because he's getting rid of his hoodie and everybody picks on him with his stupid little hoodie and his his t shirt. So because even even Mark Zuckerberg has to serve somebody, that would be a Bob Dylan song. Hey, is Tom his testimony that. his testimony is going to be open door, right? Open session. Yes, yes. But oh. he's going to do Senate and Congress. A couple days. Tomorrow's the Congress. I hope action. somebody. I hope. I hope they ask him point blank. Do you hide conservative news? Does your the way you run your company emphasize what the liberals say and and downsize what the Republicans say? I hope somebody asks him that. Well, look at Diamond and Silk. Are there, you know, black conservative women, and what did? They're what did a threat they, to our they're community. Threat to the community, isn't there that a liberal? Go. That's a liberal saying right there. A threat to our community. Yeah, community. Right. And what well, right I, does and Facebook think, have to say that? I think there's a story out that they are reconsidering that. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> you that's think? diamond and silk. The problem is that's diamond and silk. And I'll tell you something else that happened. Uh, you know, most people well, they don't do have. It all the way. I have a radio radio friend in southern california who they did it to so. exactly it's happening all over the place it's and i'll tell you what they were doing and they suddenly very quietly stopped they were starting to look into sharing medical information on facebook because a lot of people say oh you know i had chemo today please pray for me something like that mm -hmm. they were looking to share that information and then all of a sudden it very quietly stopped very recently, I think within the last couple of weeks. So nothing is actually safe any longer. Don's raising his hand. Yeah, i got to raise my hand around here. You know, I, I've actually had people call me mm -hmm. at my office and ask me if I'm okay because I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> Seriously. Did you pull your stuff no, from Facebook no. or just not post I'm just, man, I'm just so fed up with what's going on. Hey, let me ask you this, Tom, real quick. We got 45 seconds before we got to gotta go to the top of the hour here. What weight sledgehammer do you think would be needed to drive a grease BB into Mark Zuckerberg's butthole <laughs> right about now? <laughs> Man, I think that's not how I wanted to end this interview. <laughs> do you think it, Do you think an eight-pound sledgehammer even, would do the trick? I, <laughs> He's not even going to answer that. I don't want I you to answer I'm that. I am not an expert in that particular field. Well, you see, go. you're in Northern California okay. where they don't even know what a sledgehammer is. But I'm going to say an eight-pound sledgehammer. I have one. I have two, actually. But you are a, <laughs> a legal eagle, and we want Donald Trump to hire you. Tom Del Beccaro, again... Find him at politicalvanguard.com. His book, The Divided Era, is a must-read. You've read him in the Weekly Standard and Forbes and Breitbart and The Daily Caller. You've seen him on a lot of the major TV shows. Tom Del Beccaro, thanks for your legal insight here in the midst of what's going on, as usual, on Cowboy Logic Radio. Thanks so very much. All right, gang, after the break, we're going to be talking to Charles Ortel and Jason Goodman, the latest on the Clinton Foundation investigation coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Everyone, I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this is Cowboy Logic Radio.
Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen, who's behaving himself right I now. I plan on behaving myself from this point forth, Donna. Why? No more silly games. Why? Because I'm <laughs> Don Newen, ladies and gentlemen. Back to you, Donna. <laughs> and we are going to have an old friend on, along with a, friend a new that's old. friend. Is he well, a friend that's old or an old I friend? Am. He's younger than I am. Uh, anyhow, I, <laughs> I don't want to bring that up. Ladies should never talk about their age. There's a lot of people that are younger than you. Shut know. up. <laughs> <laughs> that would be one Charles Ortel. But we're also going to say hello to one Jason Goodman. And Jason is having his inaugural appearance here on Cowboy Logic Radio. He's a, a Cowboy Logic virg- virgin, I guess we could say. <laughs> Okay, first, let me introduce you guys. I don't think now, I'm going to say that. <laughs> Is that okay with you? J- J- yes. <laughs> Suddenly Jason. it became Brokeback Mountain. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> okay. He is a cowboy. Uh, All right. Jason is a filmmaker and now editor-in-chief of Crowdsource The Truth. He does a great thing with um, Charles Ortel called Sunday with Charles. He worked in uh, as a filmmaker in a lot of 3D. He's got a lot of stuff that, uh, well, let's put it this way. He just knows what he's talking about when it comes to filmmaking. Okay? NYU graduate. And so hello, Jason Goodman, to you from us hello, here at Donna. Cowboy. And Charles and Ortel, folks. Everybody knows Charles. Charles K. Ortel, please. Yes, he is an investment banker and asset manager. You've seen him on all the big news channels. And he was the chairman, way back in another life, of the conservative party at Yale. He ran for the president of the the union at Yale, right? Isn't that what it was called? The Yale Union? And lost Yale to politi- a lib? Yale Political Union. Yeah, and lost to a, a lib. Surprise, surprise. And he was also <laughs> an imposter on To Tell the Truth. That way is true. Back then. <laughs> you got to love that. But, folks, Charles Ortel is on the leading edge of the investigation into the Clinton Foundation. Again, as an investment banker, seriously, and asset manager, Charles knows how to read financials. And he has had a humongous uh, amount of work done for the last, what, four or five years, Charles, right, on the Clinton Foundation? Just three, just three. It seems like five, but it's only three. (laughs) But it's amazing what you guys have come up with. And your latest, Charles, is in LifeSet, Laura Ingram's... um, uh, website which basically if you would um charles and i want to get to that but i want to get to jason first so i'm going to tease everybody to listen you've tied in the Mueller investigation essentially with the clinton foundation and the reason why comey and rosenstein and Mueller and everybody else are dragging their feet with this investigation because they're all tied in with the super deep state i want to call it and that would be the clinton foundation but i want to get to jason goodman first Jason, tell us a little bit about yourself. What actually is Crowdsource the Truth and, and um, how you and Charles kind of got together? Well, uh, Donna, Crowdsource the Truth is essentially an idea that came to me almost organically. I, I didn't sit down and write a business plan and, and say, hey, I'm going to do this. I just, uh, I, uh, my 3D film production ke- uh, career sort of slowed down in Hollywood and I came back to New York and... I had become very frustrated with the nature of information that people were sharing in social media. So much of it was just obviously false to me. And and I'm not saying like I read it and thought it was false. I read it and there were gross inconsistencies within the context of any given story that people were sharing. So I, I just wanted to try to cut through all that and I just started posting videos about topics that I felt were important but weren't being addressed. Things like the creation of the petrodollar and how it still impacts U.S. foreign policy. And as I started putting out these videos, which were pretty typical podcast type, just me sitting in front of the webcam on the computer, I got such a strong reaction from people, both positive and negative. And actually, let me correct that. I meant people who were agreeing and people who were disagreeing. And I found tremendous value in the opinions and the positions that people took that were in contrast to what I was saying, because it created all these points of cross-referencing and people brought up topics and issues that I wasn't aware of or hadn't thought of. And I started to realize that as this information proliferated through social media, I, I was like creating a Venn diagram of every individual person's knowledge. And that collective information was just so powerful, it kind of shocked me. Like the first 
video I put out got such a strong reaction and started leading to so many of these other unrelated but also important stories. So I I just got this idea of creating a crowdsource investigative journalism uh, social media movement. And, you know, Lionel of uh, Lionel Media dubbed it a a mashup between uh, investigative journalism, social media, and reality television. And, you know, depending on what day of the week you're, you're watching and listening, those different aspects sort of uh, present themselves more prominently than others. But it really has become quite a phenomenon. And in less than a year of doing it, uh, we achieved 57,000 regular subscribers on YouTube. We've got videos on there with over 200,000 individual views. Collectively, the channel has over 11 million video views. Wow. And of course, in creating regular shows like Sunday with Charles and Charles Ortel is closing in, we've really been able to focus on bringing the research and the message that Charles and other investigators and whistleblowers and, and people who have really important stories to tell, we've been able to bring that information to the fore in a way that traditional media formats just can't allow. Jason, uh, you know, last week we were all enjoying the creepy Persian chick that was dancing around in front of a green screen that <laughs> went in and decided to shoot up YouTube. Uh, yeah. and, and she was claiming that the reason that this was taking place is because they were squelching her her uh, content and, you know, trying to limit her exposure, which after seeing some of the creepy videos probably wasn't a very bad idea on the part of YouTube. <laughs> but uh, have you experienced any of that censoring coming out of YouTube or any other social media for your work? Well, you know, it's it's a complicated uh, issue. And I mean, the answer in a word is yes, but I don't I don't want to say that YouTube is censoring the, the way I see it. And this is based on being directly involved and looking into some of the details of this type of activity that most people don't get to see. I think that YouTube is running a gigantic company with literally millions and millions of customers. There's so much data there. There's so much going on where, you know, one person is posting a video saying something nasty about another person. And that runs the gamut from, you know, childish bullying to, you know, full on accusation of horrendous crimes without evidence. And and also legitimate exercising of free speech and bringing forward important information that mainstream sources maybe don't want to come out. But I, I don't place the blame entirely on YouTube. And this is not to absolve uh, Google, but I think that really what it comes down to is YouTube and Google are trying to create policies that can apply to everyone. And when you have so many people in so many circumstances, it's difficult for that to work. And, you know, with Crowdsource the Truth, we've been working, in addition to the work that we've done with Charles Ortel, exposing the crimes of some of the most powerful people in the world, including the financial crimes of the Clinton Foundation and their associates around the world, literally. Uh, I've also been doing work with other researchers, people like Quinn Michaels, who specializes in artificial intelligence and computer technology and cryptocurrency. And we've been looking at things that appear, based on evidence, to possibly be fraudulent. A social media network called Steemit, that's a blockchain-driven cryptocurrency-backed social media network that the more I investigate, the more I uncover evidence that seems to indicate that it may be some kind of financial scam. And as I reveal that evidence, the computer enthusiasts or, or hackers, for lack of a better <laughs> word, that are involved in that seem to be uh, getting more involved in trying to disrupt what we're doing. And of course, what do hackers do? They bang on a system until they find the weakest point. They make a hole and they go in. So YouTube is a system. And it's got a, me a mechanism in place for filing complaints. Now, uh, people, someone went and published my uh, parents' home phone number on the internet purely maliciously and, you know, told everyone who was following them to go call my parents and, uh, you know, tell them that I'm engaged in all this criminal activity that I am not. And it's, it's strictly harassment, of course. But, uh, you know, those same people are utilizing the mechanisms of YouTube to lodge complaints against videos that we've posted. And, and certainly there are videos that sometimes uh, 
legitimately earn complaints, videos of people uh, committing murder, videos of people doing inappropriate things that obviously violate the set guidelines of YouTube. But, but you, you didn't know, do those. Well, no, we didn't do that. But yeah. but in other words, people can make a complaint for virtually anything. And YouTube doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what the complaint was. They certainly don't tell you who is making the complaint. And so in my view, this is unconstitutional because yeah. the people making the complaint feel that even though they're using an anonymous identity, which could be outside of the United States, maybe they're not a United States citizen, maybe they're not protected by the Constitution, they may even be using artificial intelligence software to manage multiple YouTube accounts. So a particular complaint may not even actually be being made by a human. And if there's and, and enough of them, they can close you down. This is the correct. thought police unfiltered and uncensored, in my opinion. I mean, well, years ago, this, if, you, if you know, you would be able you wouldn't be able to get uh, away with this. But on the Internet, you know, it's the wild, wild west. Exactly. And I mean, the issue is these uh, these people that I'm talking about, these malicious hackers that utilize anonymous entities to carry out uh these malicious strikes, you know, they're able to adapt more quickly than the law is able to adapt. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in the circumstance I was talking about where someone may be controlling artificial intelligence or maybe controlling multiple accounts on YouTube, you know, I, I don't think the Constitution applies to artificial intelligence software. I don't think it applies to people that are outside of the United States or not United States citizens. And also the people doing this want to gerrymander, uh, gerrymander the Constitution in such a way that they have their right to what they consider free speech, but I don't have the right to face my accuser or know right. what I'm being accused for. I they was just, say, just about to this say video that. video is you? bullying, yeah. and they don't tell me how or why, and then I, how can I stop doing what it is that they don't want me to do if they don't tell me what it is? Right. So YouTube needs to really adjust their guidelines and need to understand the methods through which malicious individuals are able to censor. And, and I, I'll tell you this, I think a lot of these people are deliberately doing this. I think they're doing it to malign YouTube. And again, I'm not trying to protect YouTube. I'm trying to understand the mechanism through which this is happening. And I even have evidence to indicate that many of the people that are doing these attacks, specifically on Crowdsource the Truth, are doing it such that they can drive traffic to this Steam exactly. network. Hey, Charles, why don't you go get a cup of coffee? Because I want to ask Jason some more questions. <laughs> no, no, here. it's great. I'm <laughs> delighted you're doing this. I'm delighted you're doing okay. this. Here, so we've Jason, actually had we've actually had our channel crowdsource the truth on YouTube disabled by these malicious attacks. Well, We're unable to upload exactly, new videos. But it's not even so, YouTube. It's everything. Twitter said they can read President Trump's private right. tweets. I mean, come right. on. Facebook, um, obviously, with Cambridge Analytica is under scrutiny. But we have videos of a woman back in 2013 who ran uh, uh, Barack Obama's online campaign of course out of chicago essentially bragging about how she used social media to let him win in 2012 and, right. and that was okay because you got pictures of zuckerberg up there kissing barack obama practically they're hugging each right. other and you know it's buddy buddy so this right. to me is the left i hate to say it just like they're doing uh with protests and everything they're trying to shut down free speech and the well, left is a hell system. of a lot more uh, you know, I guess together on this, the the right is just always out there as usual, just letting things happen. Unfortunately, the left is very, very together on this and, and really pushing it, I think, uh, to the point where it's making a huge difference. Well, they're very adept at rigging the system, whether it's on YouTube, forcing crowdsource the truth to be shut down. And we've had to create crowdsource the truth too on YouTube. Well, they, they didn't rig the general election that well. It, well, I mean, they're trying. They're well, trying. they couldn't not, rig an onslaught. Successful. You know, hey, look, there's there's stuff out there now saying, what, San Diego County at 138% of registered voters. So how does that happen? Don's got his hand I gotta up. Put He's my, got a question. i got to put my hand up here. Between you New Yorkers and this New Jersey Italian that i got sitting in this, <laughs> in this studio with me, uh, here's something that we all need to kind of think about, and, and especially the listeners Try to wrap your heads around this, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we are so in unchartered waters right now with this Leviathan that, that we've got with the Internet, with social media, with the ability to, you know, distribute 
uh, not only news and factual information, but also bogus nothingness. I mean, you guys probably are both aware of what was going on for years in St. Petersburg, Russia, with regard to the troll factory that they have over there and and how that is influencing things. And so I think a lot of what we're experiencing right now on both sides of the of the political spectrum, the political agendas, the political views that are in social media are that we are in uncharted waters that we have absolutely no idea how mac, you know, how unbelievably large this can all be and all encompassing as well as how to be able to wrap our heads around either, you know, the situations that you're experiencing, which you've got potentially artificial intelligence, bots that are trying to control your your content or limit or squelch your content, yeah. uh, as well as those AIs and bots that are trying to encourage and promote uh, ideals and, and views that, that we don't agree with. I mean, right. do you guys both agree that this thing is almost out of control if not out of control and we really don't have any idea of of a way to to potentially rein this thing in especially if we are true capitalists well i one thing i would say is that i would caution blaming russia for this because i'm unaware we're actually charles and i are quite popular in russia the uh, crowdsource the truth show goes out on the Russian social media network, VK.com, and we've had no difficulty there. I've got more problems with American bot masters in Phoenix, Arizona, and Mount Shasta, California. So keep in mind that just because an internet attack originates from servers in St. Petersburg, Russia, or China, that doesn't mean that people there are the ones initiating them. Virtual private networks and internet routing and all kinds of things can be done to easily mask the uh, point of origin of a software attack. So I, I, all of the blaming of Russia is, is, a, is another move by the left to villainize a country that really should be an ally of ours. They share the values and, you know, Russia's a, a market economy now. Perestroika is 20 years old plus, 25 years old. Yeah. So, you know, all this villainization of Russia I have to ask Mrs. Clinton, what happened? Why, why, why is well, that? That's, no, no, that's hold, on, hold on. <laughs> let, me, let me address this, gentlemen. First of all, I did no, in no way did I accuse the four-story building, the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia, that is a troll factory of doing anything malicious to your, right. your work. Right. Okay? But I, 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 am, I will argue that the four-story building in St. Petersburg, named the Internet Research Agency, is doing damage all over the country. I mean, all, over the, all, all over the globe. They will be. Okay? They will be. Yeah. All right? No but doubt. The thing is, the left is better organized in general. And you've got Jeff Bezos, you've got Mark Zuckerberg, you've got all the people at Twitter. They're hard leftists. They're not just, I mean, these are people to the left of Bernie Sanders. Yeah. And you know what? One thing people aren't talking about, and it quietly got stopped after Cambridge Analytical came to fruition. But Facebook was looking to gather medical information on people via their wow. posts. And they were going to get together with Obamacare and, and the big pharma and the big wow. medical insurers. And all of a sudden, that suddenly stopped in the last couple of weeks, and nobody's talking about that. So you know what? Mm. I thought... Glenn Beck was a super conspiracy theorist guy. <laughs> you know what? I still think no. he is. Well, yeah, but a lot of this stuff is coming to fruition, and it's really scary, and it is the wild, wild west. But, Jason, what you mentioned as far as Russia and what Don was talking about, I mean, that is huge, too. Tell us where we can find out about Crowdsource, the truth, what the website is, and how everybody can watch all the stuff you do. Sunday with Charles and... Of course, the Charles Ortel is closing in because he is closing in, and we're going to get to that uh, yeah, that he is. well that he very is. shortly. Um, what's, where's the website, Jason? How can everybody find you? Well, what we've tried to do is to distribute the content over as many platforms as possible so that we're not beholden to the policies or limitations of any particular one. So, of course, we're on YouTube, and right now on YouTube, Crowdsource the Truth is there, but we're not able to add new content to it. So all the previous work that we've done is on a YouTube channel called Crowdsource the Truth. Uh, 
And new videos for the time being are being uploaded to a YouTube channel called Crowdsource the Truth 2. And uh, once we get everything straightened out with these malicious strikes, hopefully both channels will have all of the same content and it's just, you know, redundancy. But people can also see it on periscope.tv slash CS the truth. They can see it on the social media network gab.ai by searching for Crowdsource the Truth. If they're in Russia, Previet, Kogdila, they can see it on vk.com, social media network that's very similar to Facebook, but uh, a Russian social media network. Uh, we're on bitshoot.com. And um, you uh, know, let's spell a, that out real quick, uh, yeah. sure. just in case uh, <laughs> somebody's <laughs> thinking about maybe a Hillary female Clinton. dog or Hillary Clinton ah, in the act of shooting. <laughs> right. So let's spell that one out for the B -I -T, listeners. B-I-T, as in bit, and okay. C-H-U-T-E, okay. as in shoot, bitshoot.com. We're on there. And, um, you know, the website is crowdsourcethetruth.org, and that's going to lead you to a Facebook page, which uh, I do agree. There's a lot of issues with Facebook, but it does allow me to have a website there without having to maintain a website in the traditional sense of making it and all that. Crowdsource the Truth is a company uh, in terms of the ownership and the full-time staff of only one, just me. Mm -hmm. And then I collaborate with researchers, journalists, investigators, people like Charles, whistleblowers, etc., and uh, I mean, again, I'm trying to explore this sort of new approach. I've done a lot of startup businesses and a lot of traditional approaches where you need a lot of money up front, you hire staff and you rent an office and you build up and then you're losing money for years and years. So I've tried to make crowdsource the truth as much of an open source and you know distributed type of, of company as possible. We have no central sponsors. We have no advertisers. I'm actually very fundamentally opposed to a news resource that's corporate owned and advertiser driven because I just feel like that's how we get into the problems we're having on the mainstream news. If yeah, Boeing can, came along, control placed a $5 million ad on Crowdsource the Truth and didn't want us writing a story about, you know, something happening with Boeing contracts or Boeing jets that's unfavorable, they would have too much control. So what we do is we are community sponsored and through Patreon.com, people can go on there and search for Crowdsource the Truth. And they can, you know, even even for one dollar a month, people are sponsoring. And the idea is to get as many low dollar sponsors as possible. So no one is being financially put out and everyone can enjoy news that's there for everyone. Absolutely. It adds up. Crowdsource the truth, too. Is that the number two or T.W.O. or the number you know, two? Yeah, the number two. OK, Jason Goodman. It's awesome. Crowdsource the truth. Uh, just everybody, please look it up crowdsource the truth dot org and again crowdsource the truth too and uh, all of the sunday with charles and charles ortel is closing in is exactly what is happening we will get back to charles ortel right after this on cowboy logic radio I want to thank the Lord for our Constitution. I also want to thank the NRA for its legacy. The National Rifle Association was started, founded by religious leaders who wanted to protect free slaves from the Ku Klux Klan. They would raise money, buy arms, show the free slaves how to use those arms, and protect their families. God bless you. Many of us probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the NRA. Let me just briefly say that gun control for black Americans, we know that gun control has ultimately been about people control. It sprouts from racist soil, be it after the or during the infamous Dred Scott case where black man's humanity was not recognized. And the, just, the beauty about some races is that sometimes they're blatantly honest. And the racist Chief Justice Taney said, we cannot allow the law to recognize the humanity of this individual because he would be able to keep and bear arms. When a lot of democratic controlled segregationist governments after the Civil War attempted to deny black men and women their freedom, they instituted black codes largely to deny 
the Second Amendment from newly freed slaves. Right after the Emancipation Proclamation, what was going on down in the southern states uh, is very clear that the Dixiecrats wanted to disarm black people to keep us from defending ourselves against the Klansmen who were murdering white and black Republicans to, to control the ballot box. So I think history is ripe with examples of, uh, of, of there's a correlation, direct correlation between gun control and black people control. This current administration is far from the truth. This agenda is becoming more and more obvious to all that it's a distraction, it's a reason, it's an excuse to carry out an ideology that is more evident every, every day and every week that goes by, that it is anti-American. And when you touch the Second Amendment, you can't become more anti-American because America would not be without her guns and guns would not be necessary without her God. We call upon Americans, both black, white, Hispanics, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and even those who are not of our faith to agree upon this. Without God, without guns, and without the Constitution, America's end will come with haste. For when they change our Constitution, they will take our guns. And when they take our guns, they will also seek to take our God. That's when Americans will fight back. You're listening to your local news source, WLBB, News Talk 1330 and FM 106.3. We're back on Cowboy Logic Radio, and again, our guests are Jason Goodman, who is a filmmaker, and he has been working with Charles Ortel. I didn't mention even before, uh, Jason, that a number of interviews that you've had, one was with uh, Charles and Jerome Corsi as well, had, I don't know, something like 20,000 or more views. It was awesome. And it's very in-depth what these guys are doing. This, these aren't just two-minute interviews. These are one, two, three-hour interviews. Jerome Corsi's, I think, was an hour and a half. But we have Sunday with Charles, and we also have Charles Ortel is closing in. Is that the show that's on Wednesdays, Charles? Yes, yes, indeed, Donna. Okay, so... All right, Charles- well, hold on, Donna. Before we move into the uh, Charles Ortel segment, I need to ask Jason, how long are you in timeout in, <laughs> with YouTube? Is there, a, is there a duration that has been put on this? Or, yeah, uh, yeah, we're about a week or two into a 90-day oh, uh, penalty, and details. I've been communicating via email with some of the uh, top people on the legal staff at YouTube, sharing my view that uh, YouTube is acting in a manner that's unconstitutional. They don't have a very effective appeal system. They don't give you a clear outline of what it is you're being penalized for or who it is that has made the accusation. So I'm really working, in addition to trying to get our channel reactivated in less than three months, I have a long-term goal of really making YouTube aware of this problem and this situation and holding them accountable and forcing them to act in a responsible way. It's across all media platforms, though, too. On my Twitter account, I have seen the Drudge Report, PJ Media, and uh, a lot of our red state the conservative cartel conservative cartel also put you know in it says this is no longer available because it right. was you know uh questionable material which is bs quite right. frankly all right, right so charles ortel you are an investment banker and an asset manager your claim to fame is you know how to read financial statements big time and for the last three plus years you've been looking into the clinton foundation and you've had unbelievable, it's just ridiculous. Give us, if you can, in a nutshell, what's going on. And your latest, I want to get to, that's on Life's that which ties in Mueller, Rosenstein, pretty much the entire special counsel Comey. with the Clinton Foundation. Comey. Comey. Yep. Comey. Comey. Yep. Comey's so- tied in, too, from what I understand, <laughs> Donna. <laughs> you know, you. Mueller... Mullah's in there, and you got Comey, and you got the Rosenstein. You know, yeah. they're all tied in together with the, the bad state people. state is I don't a hell of a lot deeper than we that, thought you know? it was. Yeah. Hey, how so was that, Charles? Swamp. Does that sound pretty New York to you? <laughs> yeah, you're doing, you're, you're doing good. Not bad for a <laughs> You know, I work Georgia. on this. I work on this so during the week, you know. Good. I eat a little spaghetti, and I talk about Do you know what Don guys. did when I moved down here, you what guys? What did he do? He... 
he played my cousin Vinny for his kids so they get used to hearing me talk. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's a good one. Uh, well, share a little bit very quickly with Pesci before Sarah. we get into Charles here. Talk about uh, you How know you, you, you were in a restaurant. You didn't you were questioning the the quality of the Chinese food, I think. Yeah, I think the Chinese food here is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> They you you went to your Chinese local strip food. mall? Yeah, really. They don't have good Chinese All right, so food before yours. we get going, Charles, let me ask you, Charles, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. You're doing good. I'm doing good, too. Jason, you're doing good. I'm doing pretty good. Come on. Doing all right. Yeah, Donna, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Oh, uh, you're doing okay? You're not doing good? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing okay. Okay. Everybody's guys, doing okay. Good. Guys That's good. Okay. Everybody's okay. That's good. Can Charles Hotel get to the Charles, Foundation tell one us of these this. years? Tell us this, my friend. You know, three years ago, I remember, a little over three years ago, I think, I remember where I was standing when I received a phone call from you at about 9 o'clock at night one night, and you said, man, I got something really big, really big. And really? that was the first night I was actually standing in a uh, uh, health care assisted for our friend Mikey. Yeah, our friend he was, who was... He was, in, uh, he was dying of cancer. Yeah, unfortunately dying of cancer. Sorry. And that's when you told us about Ranbaxy. And that's why I remember, because I came out of his room to take your call, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Ranbaxy, a drug company, says, oh, it's okay. It's just a bunch of black kids in Africa. What do we care? And this is the same thing with the Bush, Clinton, uh, Haiti, <laughs> supposed... Uh, Stuff that was, you know, billions or millions that were that was gathered never got to Haiti to help them. Haitian relief. I mean, it's ridiculous. All right, so put it into perspective, Charles. I mean, we've got you got about twenty one minutes here. We're going to shut up. We're going to let you talk. Put this into perspective in layman terms, so that especially a guy like me that went to University of Tennessee can wrap his head around what you're talking about. Sure. Uh, so this this whole idea of charity fraud. Um, is is uh, one of the most evil practices that you can think about doing. There are really a lot of people around the world, and still today in 2018, in desperate shape after an earthquake, after a volcano or whatever, tsunami, uh, horrible diseases. So much of the world does not have doctors, nurses, electricity, hospitals, the ability to treat these dread diseases. And so when powerful people that have been elected, former political dynasty type people, the Bushes, the Clintons, and other people like that, stand up after a disaster and say, hey, we're going to help. You know, the gullible people around the world will just, particularly now with PayPal and other means, they'll send a lot of money towards a charity thinking, you know, they're helping out. And if you've got people like the Clintons who are crooked as hell, um, you know, gaming the whole system so that the, the torrent of money that goes towards the problem is shifted over on the side into somebody, some other secret bank account, you know, that's not good. And this has been going on with the Clintons going way, way back. So the technique is, and I, I feel myself as being somewhat careful with numbers and checking things out. And even it took me a while to figure out the magnitude of this fraud. The first thing they do is they create multiple similar sounding entities. So if you were to look carefully at the Clinton Foundation at every tax return, start in 1998, what you would realize, first of all, after you got to it, is that the name of the entity that's listed on the tax return, which actually has to be its proper real name, is incorrect. The real name of this thing is the William J. Clinton Presidential Foundation. On the tax return, it says William J. Clinton presidential foundation and then they have multiple addresses different post office boxes here street addresses there and they go around and they register that lets them get mail to these addresses which they can then take in and get bank accounts around the country and around the world and no one if you you know if you're prepared to steal and you don't have a responsible person say well wait a minute that's not supposed to happen <laughs> uh you end up in the place that's described in this article where um, I thought it was really odd, and I've been saving this until people really were focusing on it. It was really odd to me to see that the largest single expense for the Clinton Foundation in their 2010 tax return was $37.2 million sent to a post office box in Baltimore for something called the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund. And if you go on their Clinton website, there's no information about the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund. It's a joint venture with George W. Bush's foundation. And it should be on their website. 
Is but it W or is it HW? This is W. Wow. The Katrina one is HW. They uh-huh. did it there too, uh-huh. and they also did it with the did tsunami. The bushes, right? <laughs> did the bushes um, file proper returns too? I mean, they obviously are part of this improper. Whole thing. Improper. So, so the, the issue here with this this staying for a second on the Clinton Bush Haiti fund, we'll we'll be breaking some news here that there are so many people implicated in the failure to discipline the main Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Bush Haiti fund for this fraud with Haiti that started with regard to the Clinton Bush joint venture by January twenty eighth, two thousand ten. If we go back to two thousand ten. You know, that's Brock was sort of given his honeymoon year in 2009. It was a rough honeymoon. But by 2010, um, here, you know, you got the midterm elections looming and you got the Tea Party brewing and you've got all this mayhem happening. And uh, in April of two, we talked about this on Sunday with Charles several times. In April of 2010, we found the paperwork wherein Barack and Michelle Obama contribute over $200,000 to this fraud, the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund, right? thereby putting them in a place where so long as he's president, they can't investigate this Clinton Bush 80 fund. Not that 200,000 is big money for them, but it goes to down a rabbit hole that would be very, very embarrassing. So the Clintons have, you know, the, the whole justice against the Clinton Foundation gained so long as she becomes president, which fortunately that didn't happen. <laughs> so-, so that's the big story. Obviously, Trump is the monkey wrench in this whole thing. He can't succeed. Otherwise, the House of Cards is coming down because yeah. everybody is implicated here. Well, and as they say, but wait, it gets worse. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Yeah, free shipping. <laughs> no, right now. So, so the, the, when you go into this, you discover in this article, you know, uh, I have a great editor in Mark Tapscott and the people over at uh, Life Set or Poly Set or whatever it's called now. Um, and they really helped me tighten it to piece up and get it some prominence. But if you go back into the history, you discover that the Clinton Foundation actually was under investigation from February 2001 to sometime in 2005. And in that piece, there's a link to 600 plus pages of evidence that's redacted. But there's enough stuff in there to see that James Comey was leading the investigation, that brilliant dunce was leading the investigation as the U.S. attorney or prosecuting the investigation, the U.S. Attorney, Southern District of New York, starting in January or thereabouts 2002. And Robert Mueller's FBI, Robert Mueller personally was aware of this investigation, which took way too long to do bupkis, to do nothing. <laughs> now, what were these idiots doing for four years? They probably were being told, look, you know, if you go there and implicate us, the Clintons, we're going to go there and implicate you, the Bushes. Right. This is just as the, at the time as Mueller is going hog, hog wild with this guy Weissman against the Enron people. And so I can imagine, and other people, I can imagine a scenario back then where, you know, the Clinton side said, well, you know, if you go against us, we're going to put pressure to go against you before the election, the pivotal election of 2004. So you have to go into all that. And, you know, it, does, it shouldn't take that long. You go to somebody, you know, who's 10 years old who can do basic arithmetic and you ask and can read and you tell them, go find the audits for the Clinton Foundation for 2001 to 4 on their site. And they'll come back and say they're not there. <laughs> and then you say, well, how and about look? Isn't that illegal? I mean, the IRS audit is mandatory, correct? Well, that's the IRS form. I'm talking about the independent accounting forms, which also have to be in the public domain that are omitted of the the principal inter, interface with the public, the Clinton website, but we found them. And in this article, we linked them. You can see for yourself. Then you take that 10-year-old child and you say, a, a charity has to have audited financial statements that comply with accounting standards in the United States of America. Can you please read this sentence out loud? And the sentence runs something like, these financial statements are prepared using principles that are not allowed in the United States of America. <laughs> then you ask the 10-year-old, does this seem sensible to you? And more likely, when my kids were 10, they go, no, these people are liars. They're liars. That's not so, right, Daddy. Yeah, I know. You can't lie about a charity. Anyway, well, they did. And here you've got Rosenstein. You know, he, in the period 2001 to 2005, if we should b- believe his resume, which I don't, because I think he's lying about his role in 1998, looking at Hillary, his official website. We're going to get into that. But if you believe the one that's on the Department of Justice website from 2001 to 2005, as this fraud escalated, who was the person who had the call on prosecuting tax fraud? 
Rod Rosenstein. <gasps> so, so they couldn't find this fraud. Comey, Mueller, and Rosenstein couldn't find an obvious fraud. And they're the ones who are supposed to be impartially you know, involved, looking at whether Russia may have meddled in the election. I call mega BS on that one. Yeah. And that's before you get to what you were talking about. After he did such, he made his bones, you know, not letting the Clinton Foundation go forward. They put him in Baltimore, a port that is porous and has all kinds of problems. And the people and a horrible mayor and is a hotbed for illegal activity. He's the guy sitting over Baltimore, Maryland. He's the guy leading the prosecution against Uranium One. He's the guy leading you know, the, the traffic. He's the guy leading the Rambaxi matter. You going to let that guy run the Justice Department now under Trump? I mean, whoever inserted Rod Rosenstein into the mix, that person needs to be investigated. And the process of how Rosenstein got to be selected for all this, I think it stinks to high heaven. We pay $6 trillion a year for government in this country, and we deserve to get better than this type of government. And Donald Trump is being held up. He's being railroaded. What did you just this morning suggest? That uh, maybe it was Barry who suggested that that what we ought to do is we ought to have a, a an image of Donald Trump, celebrity, you know, apprentice. You're fired with a picture of you know Comey and Rosenstein and uh, and Mueller. Yeah. I mean, this is this is ridiculous what these people are doing. This article is the first of many. We're now going to be uncovering all kinds. And you mentioned closing in. We're taking it up a, up a level, or as Emerald Lagasse likes to say, you know, we're, we're kick it up a notch. We're going to kick Bam. it up a notch. Bam! <laughs> but no right, hot sauce. Hey, hold on, Charles. Let me <laughs> let me first of all reintroduce you guys, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Jason Goodman and we've got Charles K. Ortel on with us. Charles, you know, for three plus years, I have hit you almost every time we've done an interview with when are the cards going to fall, and you know we're still waiting for that to happen we're praying that it happens but i want to throw a little bit of a uh, a wrench into the gear of that question and and lay out to uh, all of all three of you here you know if that house of representatives if the house flips in november do we have any chance of of justice coming to the clinton foundations you know, in my view, it's got more to do with the Department of Justice than it does the Congress, because Congress, as far as I know, they don't need to vote as to whether or not something is a crime. I it get is either that. a crime but or the, not. But a the crime. reason we, that we're the reason that we're in this absolute corrupt cabal is because of the corruption that are within the top ranks of these agencies, and this was all this was all dealt with at least over the past eight years. And these people are embedded in there. I mean, good God Almighty, if, if any of the th four of us were in that White House, you know, it's real easy to armchair quarterback here, but my gosh, would we have people that are in these positions still relevant? And they are. So, so what, when we got into this, Jason and I, and even before I met Jason when I was working on GE, um, I realized that to rely on any single national government to get the job done was not a smart move. So, and I think Jason shares that view. So what we did, uh, and we had the benefit of the prior work on GE and AIG and General Motors and other things. We had the benefit of also being, as Donna was so polite to say to us, older than, it, at least in my case, really, really old. So I have a lot of friends around the world. What we've done is our shows are tailored, the Sunday with Charles and closing in shows, our, our target audience is investigators, the equivalent of the FBI around the world in all these countries. And they have been watching. And, you know, they're waiting to see signs that have, are now emerging. We have now two U.S. attorneys. We have the one that we know about in Little Rock, Cody Highland, and then the other one, in, now the new guy, John, John Huber, out in, in, in Utah. Those are the two we know about. There could be others looking at this because there's many aspects. There's public corruption. There's bribery. There's Foreign Corrupt Practices Act issues. There's a mail fraud, which is a serious issue predating the income tax. You know, the postal inspection people take that kind of stuff really seriously. This is an ongoing mail fraud. They're soliciting right now you know, over the mail, over, you know, over the Internet, over the telephone. It's an unprosecuted mail fraud of epic proportions around the world. No one really knows what's in the envelopes that are being sent back and forth to all these post office boxes, What, how they got the money into the Baltimore post office box. Did they send a check 
to a post office box for thirty-seven point two million dollars. <laughs> you know, do they send more than that and, and only you know high skive off fifty million for themselves and end up only with thirty-seven point two? Anyway, so there are you know when when uh, we got on, involved in this in the beginning, when I got involved, I went actually to see Jerry Corsi, and he said to me, "There's a simple way to do this, in which case you will be very quickly dead." I, that didn't sound like a door I wanted to no. open. So I said, what's the other case? He said, well, share this with as many people as possible. So that's what we've been doing. Well, we put and, our and, stuff and stay away from and barbells. You, and your work is phenomenal. <laughs> you know, the thing is, though, I, and I know you'll acknowledge this. Thank God Hillary Clinton wasn't elected in 2016 yep. or people like you and and Corsi and all of the great work that, quite frankly, the the conservative voice is trying to spread would have been shut down and this stuff would have been absolutely buried to a point where it could never have been brought back out to light now yeah. be, i do we'd have be slicing a slicing garlic with razor blades in prison exactly. <laughs> if that i do have a concern with this house flipping because what they're going to do is they're going to we'll spend the next 2 years with the mainstream media and everybody that is is in 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 politics at a federal level especially is going to be doing everything they can to impeach trump that's where the attention will be will be laid they may even come up with a way to impeach him do i think it would be valid no i don't but also they're going after governorships they're going after state uh house houses and senators in states and the thing is if they can tip the scales enough is this going to bury all of the hard work that you guys are doing? And I pray to God it doesn't. Well, we thought about that. So, so the good news to report here is that we're not, we've gone, we've had teams of people looking state by state, country by country. Deadlines now approach. Not only the filing deadline, which is May 15th, 2018 for 2017, but far more important deadline is that when you have an adverse or significant change in your legal documents, under multiple state statutes, you have to inform the state authorities within 30 days of the, that change. The Clintons made a massive mistake by in, in New York by waiting till June 27, 2017, to report a change that occurred on September 10, 2015, where they concentrated control illegally of the Clinton Foundation into the hands of the Clinton family. You're not allowed to do that, but they admitted that they did do that. And they haven't fully explained that, I don't think, to be charitable to their accountants. They're in a world of hurt, and they continue to solicit each day. That's the beauty of this. This isn't a secret conspiracy. This is in the (laughs) open. You know, they're going to solicit across state lines. There's a record of all that. You have forms they have or have not filled out. And if they're filled out, they're all incorrect. They've lied to the IRS. They've lied to governments around the world. And the good news for us is they did so on paper. Mm. And they can't say, well, let's just destroy all the records, because that compounds their criminal uh, problems. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, so this, uh, this is something that's going to play out, in my opinion, before the midterm election, because uh, you know you, the deadlines are there. Lots of people are watching this. I can tell you, the piece that you're, you, these pieces are now getting a lot of attention. You can see in the traffic. And uh, people care. People play by the rules in this country with regard to charities. The Clintons don't think they have to. And they need to be used as an example. We need to step on these people and you know, take away their loot, take away their freedom. And in the case, I'd be very nice to Chelsea Clinton, other than calling her the world's diarrhea expert. Uh, <laughs> we've been very nice so far. But if we see her fighting this, we are going to turn and we uh, I have no problem thinking about a future in which Bill, Hillary, and Chelsea Clinton are in separate prisons, you know, uh, and their children are brought up by war, by, in foster homes. I had no problem thinking hashtag, about that. It's hashtag double standard, though, because you've got everybody talking about, oh, my God, look what Trump's kids are doing and, and how corrupt they are, and they had dealings with Russia. Meanwhile, you've got Joe Biden's kids and everybody else going over on government planes taking billions of dollars. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, Charles, we only have a couple minutes left. Talk a little bit, if you would, about what you told us years ago, and that is Uranium One, if you can encapsulate that one. Well, that's a really dangerous one for the Clintons because, you know, they've tried to insulate themselves by amending only the, the financial statements for 2010 forward. When you go back before 2010, you go into world of hurt zone, and we've got the French government on them already. Very powerful people are on this. 
Um, in that time frame, 2005 to 2009, there was no authorized HIV AIDS activity anywhere, yet they were taking hundreds of millions of dollars that have disappeared. Uranium One informant has apparently got proof of money, cash money, going to the Clinton Foundation in this exact time frame when Rod Rosenstein's supposedly investigating the core and missing, you know, the blind, he's, he's worse, worse than Elmer Fudd. <laughs> I mean, he's got this, this Unitate thing sending hundreds of millions of dollars. Fabian Shalandon has done great shows with us on that. Um, missing that, missing this Uranium One. And now we have a real informant who's been talking to Congress, talking to the FBI, talking to people around the world. He's got credible inside information. Think about how many other inside people are likely there. And don't assume that number is one. Don't even assume that it's yeah. just as low as 10. It's probably pushing up into the hundreds, mm. uh, is, is my bet. Somebody's going to flood. And Somebody Robert Mueller to. supposedly gave some of the uranium samples to the Russians while this is going. Why would we give any uranium at all to the Russians? I mean, this is our national security. This is all part well, of the bigger one world order, in my opinion. And the Clintons yeah. really are the modern day version of the old West snake oil salesman. Well, remember, this goes back to 92 or before even. And but in the 92 period forward, that's when the Soviet Union blew up. That's when Clinton allies and Bush allies looted the former Soviet Union, I would argue, by unfairly snapping up assets at very low prices. A lot of money was made in this period. Mark Rich made money doing this. Mm -hmm. To do this properly, you've got to go back into this low, long period, at least back to 88, maybe earlier, and say, you know, there's been a 30 year war against the American people anyway, by these elites who are engaged in, in wholesale, unlicensed bribery and corruption. It needs to be fully exposed. These tech giants, if they're doing the same thing and, they, and they're implicated, they need to be fully exposed. A lot of crimes and a lot of wealth have, been, uh, have occurred here. We need to have an accounting here. And honestly, people on the left and on the right, I think, are together on this. The Bernie supporters, the people who are for Trump, you know, all believe do not, that charity fraud has to be punished and are Absolutely. mostly anti-corruption, except perhaps for Bernie's wife. Yep. Jason Goodman and Charles Ortel, we are out of time. We need to do mm. this another time, that's for sure. Again, folks, Charles Ortel is closing in is a video Jason works on. It's a weekly show. Find it at Crowdsource the Truth, CrowdsourceTheTruth.org, and, and search for it on YouTube at Crowdsource2. CharlesOrtel.com is where you can find all of Charles's work. Jason Goodman and Charles Ortel, this is amazing. You guys are doing yeoman's work trying to expose everybody in the deep state. It's just awesome. And we thank you so much for joining us here on Cowboy Logic Radio. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you very and much. And that winds up another show, folks, at Cowboy Logic Radio. Find us at CowboyLogic.us. And we'll see you next week. In the meantime, God bless America. 